All right, we're going to get started. I just want to start by thanking those of you who are on the line for joining us. And I'll just go over a couple of housekeeping items before I introduce our presenter to you. First of all, my name is Lindsay Kalflesch. I am a knowledge broker with Gambling Research Exchange Ontario. Uh, as you enter the WebEx platform, you'll notice that your mics are automatically muted. We're going to keep them muted just to reduce background noise throughout the presentation. I would encourage you to hold on to your questions until the end. We'll save about 15 minutes at the end for questions. But if you have a burning question or a point of clarification, you can use the chat function to send me a message directly, and then I can um, moderate that throughout. But if at all possible, please save them until the end. Um, at the end of the presentation, which will be about 45 minutes in length, we will open the floor to questions from the group. And there's a raise hand function within the WebEx platform that will allow me to notice that you'd like your mic, your mic to be unmuted. And then I can do that for you so you can speak to the presenter directly. And then you'll notice as you exit the platform, there is a very brief evaluation, which just helps us to get a sense of if these webinars are useful for you and your organization. So if you could take a couple moments to fill that out, we would be very grateful. Just so you're aware, we will record this webinar in full. So um, if you need to drop off partway through, or if you'd like to share with some of your colleagues and stakeholders, this will be up on our website, hopefully within a week following this presentation. And I think that that's all. So I will now move on to introducing our presenter. Christy is a clinical psychology student at Lakehead University in Thunder Bay. She is investigating mental health intervention for First Nations children and youth. During her dissertation project, Christy will be working with a community organization to develop a trans-diagnostic intervention founded in Anishinaabek cultural skills, addressing anxiety, depression, emotional regulation, and adjustment to trauma symptoms. This project builds upon Christie's master's thesis, which identified the community-specific mental health needs in this organization. Christie is broadly trained in qualitative and quantitative research methods, and is also interested in substance use as a form of self-medication, risk and resilience factors for substance abuse in adolescents, well as responsible gambling in Northern and First Nations communities. So, without further ado, I will pass the mic over to Christy. All right, thank you very much, Lindsay. Um, I just want to point out, I am a clinical psychology student. I'm in my first year of my PhD, so I'm not quite a clinical psychologist yet. Um, but thank you for the warm welcome, Lindsay, and I'll jump right into it. So today, I'm going to be talking a bit about Indigenous gambling within Canada. I'll give a little bit of an overview of the research that has been done to date. Uh, but before I do that, I just wanted to acknowledge some people who contributed to this project. So first off, I'd like to thank Dr. Musquash, my supervisor for providing me with invaluable information about how to conceptualize some of the information presented. And he gave me extensive feedback on my presentation and how to develop it. So without him, I wouldn't have been able to do this work. I'd also like to thank the Northern Ontario Gambling Research Hub, especially Jessica Tanner, who I know is listening. Uh, she helped guide me along the way with the development of my white paper and helped to develop some of my skills. And I'd also like to thank some of the people in the Substance Use Research Group here at Lakehead University for supporting me in developing this presentation, and as well as all of the people who are taking time out of their busy day to stop in and listen. All right, so just to give you an idea of what I'll be talking about, there's an outline of the broad headings that I'll be touching on today. And after I go through all of this information, like Lindsay mentioned, there will be room for questions. All right, so let's begin by talking about some of the historical practices of Indigenous people in regard to gambling. In many First Nation cultures, gambling has been a part of regular community traditions. It has served multiple functions, including bringing people together in social activity, as well as providing a way of redistributing wealth within a closed system. An example of this is provided by 
Takagi Gagato, who is also known as George Copway, who provided depictions of games in Ojibwe communities prior to the 1850s. In his book, The Traditional History and Characteristic Sketches of the Ojibwe Nation, games such as ball play, tossing play, and foot racing are described as community-wide events that brought people together for entertainment. One of these games, where bullets were hidden inside, hidden inside moccasins, was described as being so interesting that people would wager belongings that had a lot of relevance for their livelihood, survival, and spiritual practices. He stated, so deeply interesting does this play sometimes become that an Indian will stake first his gun, next his steel trap, then his implements of war, then his clothing, and then his tobacco and pipe. However, many urban indigenous people are not aware that traditional games may have been considered a form of gambling, and this was a finding by Bellinger, Williams, and Krusek in 2016. However, gambling continues to be a form of entertainment that is enjoyed recreationally by many Indigenous groups within Canada, and it's also estimated that Indigenous people are two to four times more likely to experience problematic gambling than mainstream Canadians. In order to get more of an idea of who is gambling, where, how, and why, I'm going to review some of the research that has been published within the last 20 years within Canada. In a recent study, Williams, Bellinger, and Prusak examined the incidence of gambling in Indigenous people within 15 urban centres in Western Canada, including Calgary, which is the picture that you see on your screen now. The researchers used a stratified sample that approximated the 2011 census on key demographic areas such as age, marital status, education, employment, and income. And they obtained a sample of 1,114 Indigenous people that came from various Indigenous groups. Within the vast, or sorry, the vast majority of people within this sample gambled in the past year, so 89.8%. Williams and colleagues investigated the type of activities that people engaged in, and they found that the most frequent type of gambling was electronic gaming machines, which include slot machines and video lottery terminals, or VLTs. Next were lottery tickets, followed by instant win tickets, bingo, raffle or fundraising tickets, and casino table games. About 50% of the sample gambled once a month or more, and approximately 20% of the sample gambled once a week or more. Within this study, gambling status was assessed using the problem and pathological gambling measure, and the chart on the slideshow shows the percentage of the sample that fits into each of the categories. Close to 60% of the sample were either non-gambler or recreational gamblers, 15% were found to be at risk, 10% were problem gamblers, and 17.2% of the sample were pathological gamblers. The researchers also asked problem gamblers what type of gambling was most problematic for them. Only about 25% of the sample reported a specific type of gambling, with over 70% of those respondents experiencing difficulties with electronic gambling machines, and just over 11% having a problem with bingo. The researchers also looked at characteristics that were predictive of problem gambling, and they found that people who lived in a city that had a higher percentage of Indigenous people in the population being male and being unemployed or a homemaker in comparison to being a student were predictive of problem gambling. Problem gambling is associated with a wide variety of negative consequences in multiple life areas, and Indigenous people are not exempt from this. The sample Williams and colleagues obtained 
it really demonstrates some of those areas that negative impacts can be experienced. The most commonly experienced problems were financial, mental health, and relationship difficulties. And these kind of parallel what other researchers have found in general populations, although mental health consequences are generally less prominent than relationship or family problems. Nevertheless, there is a lot of overlap in the negative outcomes from gambling from this sample and general population samples. The range of access and services in Indigenous populations throughout Canada is highly varied as are cultural and spiritual practices, and this makes it really difficult to generalize across broad geographical locations suggesting that researchers need to consider the rates of gambling in smaller communities or regions, examining factors that might differentially influence particular communities. In the last 10 to 15 years, there has been an increasing emphasis on producing community-specific research along these lines. The Gill and colleagues' studies is an example of this. For the project, the researchers visited four Cree communities in northern Quebec to assess how gambling is impacting residents. In the sample of 455 community members that they had gambling data for, it was found that 30% of the sample did not gamble, 53% gambled at a low or no risk level, 14.29% were moderate or high risk gamblers, and 2.20% were problem gamblers. For the rest of the analyses, they separated their sample into non-gamblers, low-risk gamblers, and moderate or high-risk gamblers. Moderate and high-risk gamblers were more likely to be younger and to have attended or completed high school. In comparison to non-gamblers and low-risk gamblers combined, moderate and high-risk gamblers were more likely to engage in other types of gambling which included such things as sports pools and informal games of poker or other card games, and they were also more likely to endorse gambling on a VLT or slot machine once a week or more. However, these groups do not significantly differ in any other type of gambling activity, for example, lottery, bingo, or casino games. Moderate and high-risk gamblers also demonstrated more severe drug, alcohol, cigarette smoking, and psychiatric problems in comparison to non-gamblers and low-risk gamblers. So 46.2% of moderate and high-risk gamblers also experienced alcohol dependence, 59.6% experienced substance abuse or dependence, and 56.3% were current smokers. It's likely that the interaction of smoking, drinking, and gambling displays similar patterns in indigenous populations with the human populations. However, this has not been explicitly examined within the current literature. And there might be a unique co-occurrence of smoking and gambling in indigenous contexts, as these behaviors may be easier to engage in for people who live in First Nation communities because of some of the exemptions that some communities have from indoor smoking bans. Some initial support for this idea was found by Boteroff and colleagues in a qualitative study that was looking at secondhand smoke exposure in a remote BC community. However, this is an area for further development. So in comparison to those non-gamblers or low-risk gamblers, moderate and high-risk gamblers also had a greater proportion of depressive symptoms and were more likely to have spouse with an alcohol or drug problem, as well as, as difficulties getting along with their partner in comparison to non-gamblers or low-risk gamblers. And within this sample, some sex differences were also found. Men spent more money and were more likely to be intoxicated by alcohol or drugs when gambling, and significantly more men reported problems including stress and anxiety. Mm -hmm. 
Another example of a geographically focused study is the Muckle and colleagues' investigation of gambling in 14 Inuit communities in Nunavut. And this was an extensive study that consisted of researchers traveling to coastal communities by boat and meeting with 677 private households. For the study sample, there was a total of 969 people. It found that almost a third of the sample gambled weekly, and women were more likely to gamble than, than men. So 67% of women in comparison to 53% of men. However, no quantitative assessment of gambling risk or problematic gambling was conducted. Almost a quarter of the sample reported a subjective experience of spending too much money or time on gambling. These types of the types of gambling that were the most popular included instant lotteries, bingo, and cards or dice. And in some of the communities, such as this one, electronic gaming machines were not available. So it's really hard to assess whether or not people have a preference for this type of gambling just because there isn't the access to it. The authors of the Muckle et al. study compared participants' gambling expenditures to Southern Quebec sample and found that 60% of the sample wagered more than $520 per year on gambling in comparison to individuals in Southern Quebec where only 9% of the sample gambled more than $520 per year. So on average, people in the Muckle et al. study spent $3,300 per year on gambling in comparison to that Southern Quebec sample that spent less than $900 per year. So there's significantly larger expenditures on gambling within these communities. Another example of a multi-community study within a specific geographical location is the 2004 Oaks and Colleagues study that examined gambling in 12 Northwestern Ontario First Nation communities from the Treaty 3 area. For this study, researchers engaged in a community-based method where community members were active participants in the process. A community advisor was recruited from each community. The communities developed questions and tailored them. And there were community research assistants that participants could choose to have the interview with, or they could be interviewed by a university research assistant. Although there were community-specific reports developed for each community, the findings that I'll talk about today come from the compiled results from all of the com communities combined. The researchers found that a quarter of the sample gambled multiple times per week, just over a quarter gambled one to two times per week, and these findings are approximately 20% higher than the Muckle and colleagues study. Almost a quarter of the sample gambled one to three times per month, and the remaining quarter rarely or never gambled. And participants were asked to reflect on their gambling behaviors and 45% of respondents perceived their own gambling as a problem. However, it's not directly comparable to the Williams and colleagues study or the Muckle and colleagues findings because of the nature of the questioning. Um, so it does seem likely that gambling problems were more prevalent in this sample than in subsequent samples. Although there was a recognition among respondents in this study that gambling was a traditional part of First Nation culture, modern gambling games and practices were viewed as more harmful. The researchers used qualitative methods to assess the primary concerns community members had about gambling, and although these differed for each community, across communities, four broad themes emerged. The first theme was that gambling has a negative impact on social relationships, especially with children and family. This is demonstrated by a quote from a participant. 
that said, my husband gets mad at me because he doesn't want me to go to bingo. The time and money loss theme is demonstrated in the quote, I get angry at myself for having spent money that I didn't have, what I'm going to do to pay the bills. The third theme was that gambling has a negative impact on the community, including tradition. This is demonstrated by one participant's statement, you get stuck in the bingo way of thinking. Anishinaabe people were group oriented. Now, everyone for themselves. The underlying hurt needs to be addressed. And the final theme was that gambling was viewed as a substitute addiction. They transferred that addiction to a gambling addiction, from alcohol to bingo. When their money runs out, fighting begins, leads back to alcohol. These findings give us an idea of how varied gambling behaviors can be across communities and how the method, methods they are assessed with influence the ability to compare across groups. And it was noted in many studies that similar to non-Indigenous populations, there are significant negative impacts from gambling. This leads to an examination of the motivations for gambling. Why do people engage in these behaviors if they have such profound effects? Very few studies have examined the motivations for Indigenous people's gambling. In 2005, Wynne and McCready examined many aspects of gambling in Indigenous groups within five Ontario geographical locations. These community-based analyses were overseen by local research advisory committees that directed the lines of questioning. <clears throat> so again, the study was really directed by the community and questions and areas for assessment were tailored for specific communities. And most of the communities did not choose to assess motivations. However, the Ottawa-based sample did. And based on focus group interviews, they found that respondents' motivations could be broadly categorized into four domains. And these were social, financial, emotional, and psychological. <clears throat> and within these responses, similarities can be seen with the broader gambling literature. For example, gambling for entertainment is positively valence enhancement motivation. That is, it makes people feel better when they are amused. This is an example of a reward expectancy outcome because it can make people feel better when they are in a neutral or positive beginning state. Under the emotional category, overcoming boredom and gambling to feel better than others are listed as motivations. And these are, again, examples of positively balanced outcome expectancies, although they would be considered to provide a good feeling by giving a sense of relief from a negative state and would therefore be classified as a relief expectancy. <clears throat> so these, the previous study's findings can be compared to the study by Bellinger, Williams, and Prusik in 2016. So within that study, participants were asked to indicate their primary motivation for gambling. And it was found that gambling to win was the most frequently mentioned reason, followed by excitement, entertainment, or fun. And males were significantly more likely to gamble in order to win money in comparison to females. <coughs> and while assumptions could be made that these results correspond with findings from non-Indigenous samples, the general lack of research in this area has left a gap in the assessment of outcome expectancies in Indigenous populations. In particular, the investigation of reward and relief expectancies might be highly informative. If assessments were done considering individuals' motives for gambling, as well as their outcome expectancies, a more nuanced picture of the higher problem gambling rate in Indigenous communities might be obtained. <clears throat> 
All right. To summarize the research that I've reviewed, there are some similarities but also some differences between the studies. And depending on how problem gambling is defined, there is a wide variety in the estimates of how many pe people experience gambling problems. In the studies reviewed here, the sample estimates range from 2.2% of the sample meeting criteria for problem gambling to 45% of people feeling like their gambling was a problem. However, there is some commonality in the types of gambling activities that are preferred, which include electronic gaming machines, lottery tickets, and bingo, although these forms are not always experienced as the most problematic, for, ex for example, lottery. And communities may vary in their access to electronic gaming machines. When it comes to motivations, it's hard to compare the results of the two studies that were presented. The Wynn and McCready study used a qualitative analysis, whereas Bellinger and colleagues used gamblers to indicate their primary motivation for gambling from a list of alternatives. Although I'm not fully aware of all of the specifics of what that list contained, it's likely that it was <clears throat> a list developed for youth with mainstream populations and may not assess all of the possible or common motives Indigenous people have. However, it seems like there are a number of similarities between these studies despite these limitations, including being motivated to win money, gambling for excitement or entertainment, and to socialize, among others. Now I'd like to turn to some factors that influence risk for developing problematic gambling. The literature has focused primarily on environmental and contextual factors to understand these elevated risks. <coughs> Across studies, experiencing abuse is tied to an increased chance of problematic gambling. In the Gill and colleagues study, lifetime sexual, physical, or, amuse, or emotional abuse was predictive of moderate or high-risk gambling. This relationship remains significant even after substance abuse and alcohol were considered. And in this same study, abuse within the last 30 days was not predictive of higher gambling risk. Dion and colleagues have demonstrated that pathological gambling is three times more likely among survivors of childhood sexual abuse and seven times higher in residential school survivors. In 2012, Curry and colleagues found that racism influenced problem gambling. Racism was a risk factor for problem gambling in the last 12 months, gambling to escape, and it increased PTSD symptoms. Sorry, it was associated with increased PTSD symptoms. <coughs> A few models have emerged to explain high incidence of problematic gambling in Indigenous communities. However, insight can be gained from a theory set forward by Fellini and Smith which was originally developed in 2007 and investigated in 2013. So they suggested that First Nations people, especially those living on reserves, have low levels of access to standard life reinforcers. These life reinforcers include such things as employment, family, friendships, and financial security. Back these reinforcers can drive behaviors such as drinking or gambling based on the perceived ability to be successful in obtaining and maintaining those reinforcers. This is often influenced by two constraints, people's access to drinking and their access to and cost of alternatives. The cost of an alternative not only refers to finances, but can include acceptance or refusal of the behavior by people or systems involved with the individual. An example of this would be if an employer <coughs> Is accepting of an employee being hung over at work. This would mean that there is a low cost situation for that individual engaging in drinking in terms of their employment. This theory also has relevance for gambling in First Nation communities 
and for First Nations people living in urban centers. In First Nation communities, obtaining meaningful employment can be quite difficult, and many of the jobs are unspecialized or seasonal in nature. Thus, people's access to employment and sub subsequent financial security is limited. Gambling may therefore appear as an easier access or even more likely solution to obtaining financial security with a lack of other alternatives. Furthermore, the cost of engaging in gambling behaviors is often quite low as gambling is fairly well accepted in many communities, thus people would not have as many interpersonal or family difficulties because of it. And the alternative activities that are available to people may be inaccessible because of financial pro prohibitions or travel prohibitions. Thus, if a community has a bingo night where most of the residents will attend, the access, access to alternatives might be highly restrictive. And some support is seen for this in the Bodorov study where women felt excluded from social circles if they did not attend community bingo nights. Other studies also provide preliminary support for this as well. For example, Williams, Bellinger, and Prosec found that problem gambling was higher in unemployed males. And in a U.S. sample, Patterns found that the rate of problem gambling was doubled when people grew up on a reservation or lived on a reservation. However, the accessibility of gambling is a bit more complex. For example, Castello et al. found that the development of a casino led to increased life reinforcers, such as income and jobs, which was associated with fewer psychiatric symptoms in adulthood. So an investigation of how this theory might apply to gambling would be really insightful. All right. So let's talk about the rates of treatment seeking. Despite the severe negative impact that gambling can have, treatment seeking is really rare in Indigenous populations. In the Williams study, only 3% of problem gamblers sought help, even though most of them were aware of services that are available. In the OPGRC report, 40% of the sample said that they had tried to quit, although most of them were unsuccessful in doing so. And some of the barriers to stopping gambling that were mentioned by people in this report included a lack of awareness, individual denial, addiction to the behavior, peer pressure from family and friends to continue, and boredom and loneliness. In general, there is a lot of room for development in regards to gambling research for Indigenous people. For example, there is a general dearth of information regarding motivations for gambling in Indigenous populations. This is an area where future research should be expanded. The existing research also focuses primarily on the difficulties that it causes individuals. However, there are likely some benefits that are derived for individuals and communities by engaging in these behaviors. One example of this is the findings by Bolteroff and colleagues, um, where they found that engaging in bingo was an important social activity for women and their children. It gave them a chance to escape their stress and it reduced levels of isolation. However, the potential benefits of gambling might, might differ by location, just like gambling behaviors themselves. So Bellinger, Williams, and Prusak found that within an urban indigenous sample, 45% of people said that the harms of gambling outweighed the good, and 49% stated that they believed gambling was morally wrong. However, consideration of potential positive influences that people experience as a result of recreational gambling can inform the ways in which gambling might contribute to some people's mental wellness by providing them greater hope, belonging, meaning, or purpose. 
So these are aspects of the mental wellness continuum framework that were identified by Indigenous scholars within Canada, and they integrate to traditional holistic cultural models of wellness that are similar across many of the Indigenous groups within Canada. An example of how an aspect like belonging might be influenced can be seen through the socially affiliative aspects that gambling can fulfill. People feel connected to other community members when they engage in a shared activity such as gambling. In my opinion, part of the adaptation of the Selenian Smith model explains a need for hope that gambling fulfills. The hope of financial security and an increased ability to thrive because of this. However, this is again speculative and would need to be investigated to see if it actually acts the way that I think it might. So where do we go from here? The two-eyed seeing approach suggests that strength from both non-Indigenous and Indigenous research can be brought together to benefit communities and develop knowledge that is relevant and appropriate. Integrating qualitative methods that incorporate community members into the research process will allow for flexibility in assessing what is relevant and important from each community that's assessed. And it can incorporate Indigenous models of understanding. An example of this can again be seen in the Bodorov and colleagues study in 2009. It was found that in many communities, bingo was the main form of community revenue. And people often viewed participation as a type of community support, with all of the funds being used for the community's benefit. This is essentially a type of redistribution of wealth within a closed system that demonstrates similarities to historical cultural practices of gambling. Also, incorporating quantitative methods can assist in comparison to other communities, which can facilitate a broader understanding of the population-based factors. And the information about motivations in this presentation are an example of this, although more qualitative investigations could be undertaken to identify unique or differing motivations across Indigenous populations before trying to compare them on metrics that have already been developed. Engaging community members in all aspects that is integral to ensure that the information that is developed is accurate to the reality that people in the community experience. One way to accomplish this is through the use of community-based participation, participatory research. In this process, community members are asked what the best way to assess the information is. They are often included in the collection of information. And researchers may check back with the community members to ensure that the interpretation aligns with their knowledge. And a strength of some of the research that I presented here is that it did rely on this community-based participatory research. So there's really good evidence that's being developed within Indigenous populations. Overall, there has been some very substantial research conducted in the last 20 years, but there is a lot of room to grow as well. So thank you guys very much for listening, and I think I'm going to hand it back over to Lindsay now to moderate the question portion. Great, thank you very much, Christy. That was really wonderful. Um, and as Christy said, we can now open the floor for questions. So as I mentioned, there's a raise hand function, which will sort of notify me that you'd like to be unmuted. I find if I unmute everyone, mass um, noise chaos begins. But if you would like to be unmuted, um, please raise your hand. And if you don't have the ability to speak into a microphone of some kind, you're also welcome to send me a chat and I can help you out that way. Just going to make sure I'm not missing anything. Christy, you might be off the hook. Oh, I got no, a question. I'm still here. I, I got a, oh, I meant like off the hook for oh, yeah. question. <laughs> um, Nicole wants to know what the, the moccasin game is called that you mentioned. 
Um, I'm not sure. They didn't publish the name of the Moccasin game. It was just described. That's totally fair. She says okay. <laughs> but there's a whole chapter on it. He describes probably eight or ten different types of games that were used in the community. That's really neat. Nicole's wondering who you're referring to. Is there a way that we can get a citation out? Yeah, um, so that's short copies, um, historical character sketches of the Ojibwe nation or something like that. Okay. But yeah, short copy. Okay. Yeah. I'm just going to unmute. I think Sylvia has raised her hand with a question. Sylvia, do you have a question? Oh, hi there. I typed out my question. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Oh, okay. Thank you. So I was just wondering, uh, you touched briefly on treatment-seeking behavior, and I'm wondering if you can expand a little bit more on sort of what treatments qualified for that treatment-seeking behavior. Was it a traditional, like, seeking an elder su from a support from an elder? Was it uh, community-based agencies? Was it, you know, treatment within, you know, on the reserve? Or, you know, that if there's any information available on what qualifies as treatment? Um, I'm not sure how Williams and Bellinger defined that. I know that within the OPGRC report, it was a fairly open assessment, so people were able to define that for themselves, so whatever they felt was treatment. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And Sarah has a question as well, so I'm going to unmute Sarah. Go ahead, Sarah. Hmm. I can't hear you very well, Sarah. Would you mind sending me a chat instead? And while we wait and see, let me just expand my... Is it possible to include your reference list when we circulate your presentation, Christy? Yes, definitely. Wicked. And um, I did mention in the beginning that we would be recording this, but for all of you who are still listening, Christy has also agreed to circulate her slides and also for me to pass along her email address. So if you guys have um, further questions that you'd like to ask, you're welcome to do that via email as well. Yep, I'd be happy to receive those. I don't see any further questions. So sort of last call for anyone if you have any burning questions. And if not, I'm going to just say thank you very much, Christy. That was really wonderful. And I'm sure that the audience who joined us has um, learned a lot about this content area. And if you are interested in learning more audience or passing this info along, stay tuned on our website for me to post the recording so that we can continue to share some of what Christy's shared with us today. Thanks a lot, Christy. Thank you, Lindsay, and everybody else. Bye. <laughs> Bye.